We've waited nearly 17 years for a true successor to the crazy fun Budokai Tenkaichi games of the PS2 era. The Raging Blast series tried to fill its spot, the Ultimate Tenkaichi series tried to fill its spot, the Spanish Budokai Tenkaichi 4 mod for BT3 poured a lot of heart and soul and passion into filling its spot, but all failed to fully scratch the itch for insane, fast-paced, controller-breaking action that the Budokai Tenkaichi series was so well-known and well-loved for. But now, Sparking Zero is finally out, and after pre-ordering it to play it a few days early and sinking dozens of hours into devouring every facet of it, I can finally sit down and write a full, comprehensive review of my many thoughts on everything this game has to offer in order to answer two questions. One, in isolation, is this a good game? And two, does it live up to the phenomenal, nostalgia-ridden memory of its predecessors? Before I jump into talking about each individual game mode, let's start by talking about the core look and feel of the game, starting with graphics and animation. Sparking Zero boasts some pretty great graphics in all areas, from the environments to the characters and everything in between. The art style is vibrant and flashy and as close to the anime as can be for something that's made in 3D. Seemingly mostly inspired by Shintani's art and animation style, which was most prominent recently in the Broly movie. I don't think the graphics are anything mind-blowing for a game released in 2024, but it's clean and very smooth, and it retains its integrity even during intense high-speed action. In fact, the graphics look even better to me when you're facing off with an enemy in a ruined city, charging up an electrifyingly colorful aura while buildings crumble around you and smoke covers the wreckage. It all comes together very well. And throughout all this action, the animation holds up spectacularly well. In combat, the animation is very fluid and dynamic, and keeps up well with the high-octane action. You don't really see any awkward movement or attacks, it all just works. And every character, all 182 of them, manage to look different on a visual level with how they function. From their fighting stance, to the variations in their basic combat string animations, to their auras, and so on. Visually, most characters stand out great with how they look and how they act. In that regard, I feel the game does a better job than the older Tenkaichi games in really varying up how its characters are presented. But this is to be expected with the advancement in technology in the many years since then. Additionally, supers and transformations look spectacular and very cinematic. They really go above and beyond and give the fights an added level of immersion and dragon balliness, for a lack of a better word. With all the different spinning and zooming camera angles, they help to give off that anime action feel, and most I've seen look very clean and super smooth. The gameplay. Now, to get into the meat of it all, the actual gameplay. The Budokai Tenkaichi games have always prioritized fun action over just straightforward balance. The games are arena brawlers as opposed to standard fighting games, so the spectacle and flair is more at the forefront as opposed to meticulous competitive balancing. The same logic applies in Sparking Zero, but this isn't to say that the combat isn't complex. It does have many layers of its own, but I do think the barrier of entry makes it more accessible than other serious fighting games. But that isn't to say that the game isn't hard, either. The Budokai Tenkaichi games have a specific flow to them, and it can take you a while to get used to things. And despite my familiarity as a mid-veteran of the franchise, I still struggled a ton when I first started playing this one. Raditz was kicking my ass and busting my balls. Great Ape Vegeta made me want to drop the game entirely. The controls felt strange to me. I couldn't get into them, even though the last time I played BT3 was only a few months ago. It was a struggle, but slowly and surely, and with some time spent in the training mode, I started to get a grip on things. There's a lot about Sparking Zero's gameplay that distinguishes it from the past entries in the franchise, for better or for worse. For starters, the fighting is much more fast-paced, with attacks just being overall much quicker, there being more vanishes that cover bigger spaces across the map, and just overall everything being more hectic. Something I've noticed with the Dragon Ball community now and in the months leading up to the game's release is that there's been a kind of wariness or aversion to criticizing the game. It feels like we got so excited to finally get this game that we didn't even want to recognize the possibility that it might have issues, or to even give credence to the notion. I think that's counterintuitive though. Because we love Sparking Zero and this franchise overall, we should be criticizing it where possible. I don't think we should be forgetting that this is a product after all, a video game we're paying to play, 
And even though it's clear a lot of love and passion has been put into it, we should admit its flaws and push for it to get better. I felt like I had to put out that disclaimer before continuing, because I will be criticizing many aspects of this game. Despite the overall fast pace of Sparking Zero, one of the only things that doesn't feel as fast as it used to in previous games is the actual movement. Movement in Sparking Zero boils down to two main methods. The classic Dragon Rush, where you're flying at top speed, and the new Sparking Zero exclusive Short Dash. In previous BT games, pressing the X button, assuming a PlayStation controller, would allow you to dash, but it wouldn't consume any key, it would be fast, it would track towards your enemy, and it would go as long as you need it to. In Sparking Zero, you have the Short Dash instead. The Short Dash replaces the classic dash, and you do it with the X button too. And while this short dash may be more tactical, I personally didn't like it as much. The way it works here is that it expands key to give you a single short distance burst of speed to cover small gaps between you and your enemy. The key expenditure and the shortness of the distance make it not very ideal to use, and I found myself personally avoiding it. Now, you might argue that the short dash has a lot more strategic potential, and you could be right, and you might argue that I'm too mid at the game to use it properly, and you would be right. But I do believe that as far as pure fun factor goes, the short dash is inferior. I feel it slows the game down and leaves less potential for direct engagement, and can leave you hitting air. Additionally, its animation sometimes comes off weirdly stiff, which further bogs it down for me. Frankly, I don't even like the Dragon Rush as much here. It feels weirdly slow and unintuitive. The Dragon Rush in past games wasn't mind-blowing or anything, and it had its issues as far as lack of strafing and usually taking a rigid, straight path when you use it to go straight at your enemy, but I always felt like when I used it for general maneuvering around the map, it was a bit more responsive. Going up and down and left and right felt somehow easier, if not exactly smoother. In Sparking Zero, while it is acceptable, it just feels a bit slow. Like you have a sparking aura of energy around you, and yet you're moving at what is seemingly an unproportionately slow pace. For the most part, I found myself using only the Dragon Dash for movement, even though it used up a lot of key. Another gameplay feature that felt significantly slower here were the Supers and Ultimates. They are admittedly much cooler than ever and much more cinematic, with camera angles and zooms and all of that, and they're awesome to see. But after a while, it can get kind of boring watching Goku take like 30 seconds to whip out his 12th spirit bomb of the match. It sometimes made me wish like I had the option to skip through them. I went back and played a little bit of BT3 after finishing Sparking Zero, and the difference was night and day. Sure, the supers are much cooler in Sparking Zero, but they feel a lot quicker in BT3, and they flow into your attacks faster and more smoothly. Since we're on the subject of supers, let's talk a little bit about key. A small issue I had with the gameplay in Sparking Zero was that I felt like there was a bit of an overdependence on key. To be clear, most of my problems with the gameplay more correlate to how it impacts general fun factor. I'm not good enough at this game to be commenting on how the more serious, competitive side of things are. But as far as fun goes, it felt like Sparking Zero was more dependent on key than ever. Primarily speaking, the Sparking mode, which you get when you charge your key up to the max, is very powerful, and I found myself spamming it in order to get through the story mode. I don't remember ever having to rely on it so much before in previous games. Sparking mode aside, most everything you do in this game takes up a lot of your key. The short dash, the dragon rush, the dragon dash, the vanishes, the instant transmission attacks, and a lot of the counters. It just felt like in order to have a proper chance of keeping up with my foes, I needed to overemphasize my concentration on my key meter in a way that wasn't as prevalent in previous games. And admittedly, it isn't that big of an issue. It doesn't get tiring or repetitive or boring to have to focus so much on charging key all the time. Because once you get a hang of the controls, charging up key and using key-based abilities becomes second nature. But it was noticeable enough to feel weird for me when I first started playing. It just felt like it removed a little bit of the fun, what with the victor in those first games being decided by who could charge up their key faster. The basic combos and attack mechanics of the game are cooler than ever, and all the extra follow-up vanishing around is really cool and adds to the high-octane action. The only issue I had with attacking was that charged attacks felt a bit clunky relative to previous games. Charged smash attacks would rarely land here, while in previous games I was always using them to push my opponents away. 
I found myself rarely ever using them here, because input-wise, it felt like they wouldn't always trigger appropriately. And even if they did trigger, the AI in this game being as cranked up as it is almost ensured that your enemy would vanish away from the attack, at least in the episode battle story mode. There is a little bit of input lag here and there, which at first I assumed was just me being bad at the game, but later realized many people were suffering from. Sometimes it's hard to get your character to do what you want them to do, especially using classic controls. Mostly, this was prevalent when I would try to use super attacks or my ultimate attacks, but the controller wouldn't register them and instead go for a follow-up vanish attack. It's not so much of an issue that it often gets in the way, but I would imagine it could be frustrating for people playing ranked online matches. Though this is something I presume is simple enough to be fixed with patches moving forward. As I mentioned before, the AI here is tough, so for your regular gamer, it takes a while to get into the flow of things. But if you're patient with it, it becomes very rewarding when you finally feel like you have a grip on things and start kicking ass. One other mechanic I feel iffy about here is the plethora of different types of counters. You have the revenge counter, the super counter, you have vanishes, you have perceptions, super perceptions, sway-ins, sonic sways, and so on. The sheer number made it confusing for me to really get a grasp on which I'm supposed to be using at any given time. But we can chalk that up to a skill issue, as I assume more hardcore players appreciate having options. As far as fun goes though, it can put a little damper on things when you have so many options for countering that you end up getting choice paralysis and not using any one. Overall, the gameplay is pretty fun, but the changes to the movement, over-dependence on key, and vast array of countering options made it not as fun for me as it could have been. Still, when you get into the groove of things, most of these issues really fall to the wayside, and your focus turns towards all the balls-to-the-wall fun of slamming your Dragon Ball toys into one another. Now, before we move on to discussing each individual game mode, let's talk a little about sound and music. Sound is top-notch in Sparking Zero. Voice acting is mostly consistently amazing, sound design is on point, Every punch, every hit, every blast sounds great, interactive, and satisfying. You've got some iconic lines returning from the previous games, which are awesome to see back in action. They scratch such a nice nostalgic itch. Overall, it's just a big upgrade over the previous games in the sound department. The sound feels even more reactive, like when you're beating on someone and you can clearly hear all the back and forth grunts, groans, and battle cries. Even during supers and ultimates, your opponents audibly react to you in a way that feels more real and less like you're in a scripted ability cutscene. I don't remember that being as prevalent in the previous games, if at all. So yes, sound is amazing overall, but the music... Badass music has been a staple of this franchise as far back as BT1. It's a crucial part of the Budokai Tenkaichi experience, and most tracks in those games were absolute memorable bangers. Sure, the nostalgia plays a big role in that, but aside from that, the tracks from those games were incredibly energetic and totally electrifying. They really got your heart pumping and fit amazingly with the action. You can't hear the classic BT2 intro music building up. without feeling your energy rising to new heights. And you can't listen to shit like this without your energy absolutely exploding. That shit was hype. And that's just the opening intro music. Sadly, Sparking Zero disappoints here. Even though its opening cinematic is awesome, uh, in a similar style to the previous games, it reuses Genkai Tapa x Survivor, one of Dragon Ball Super's opening themes. <laughs> Which is awesome on its own, but it isn't enough to carry this cinematic. And all throughout the game, the background music is pretty acceptable, but it's just that, acceptable. It rarely ever goes beyond that, except in a few instances here and there. It's not as energetic and distinctive as the previous game soundtracks. It's just okay, but not really super memorable. More than that, it even felt like the music mixing in this game was not very good. Even when I cranked the background music up to 100 in the settings, it still felt like it was still relatively low compared to the overall sound of the game. I didn't always get to feel it sinking in with the gameplay and really pushing me into intense action.
Tracks like those are decently cool, but I don't think they really stand a chance against tracks like... So yeah, sadly, on the music front, Sparking Zero just doesn't hit like the older Budokai Tenkaichi games, even if you try to set aside the huge nostalgia factor. With that aside, I'll be getting into each of the game modes and talking about what I think works and doesn't work, starting with arguably the most important, the story mode, called Episode Battle. I've always absolutely adored the story modes in the past Budokai Tenkaichi games. I loved experiencing that same goddamn story repeated time and time again with subtle alterations. It was just really fun to play through. I think the series peaked story mode-wise with Budokai Tenkaichi 2. In that story mode, you would fly around the map of the Earth to get to specific points on the map which would trigger the next mission in the story. Along the way, you could also stumble onto random side objectives or challenges, gather random items and Dragon Balls, and so on. It was very simple in execution, but it added an extra element to the story mode besides the actual story itself. Budokai Tenkaichi 3 dropped the flying around the world aspect for a more straightforward stage select. In battle, you'd press R3 to trigger some of the battle's main events, such as a character automatically dying or switching out or firing a super attack that they did in the anime or whatever. It made the whole thing much simpler and more straightforward, but it allowed the developers to cover more of the story. And that, to me, was good enough. Now, in Sparking Zero, the story mode went in a different direction, more akin to the Budokai games, where you select one of eight characters and go through their individual story mode. While the other Tenkaichi games had isolated what-if sagas, Sparking Zero incorporates what-if scenarios into the flow of each character's individual story mode, where if you complete a battle in a way unlike how it happens in the anime, you could unlock a non-canon what-if continuation of events based on that change. Alternatively, you're sometimes presented with a choice where you can choose to take the story in a different direction than the anime, triggering you to go into a what-if branch. My first problem with episode battle was its UI. Maybe this is a controversial opinion, but I didn't enjoy the menu at all. It felt incredibly clunky and difficult to even sort through, unless you pull up the alternate point-by-point uh, -point menu for quicker but less clear traversal along the map. The battles are basically spread into areas slash sagas, and you move along them to get to the next battle. But in a strange design choice, you can also see other characters' battles on your current character's map, but locked and muted in a weird way. So, if I'm playing as Goku, I have to shuffle through points on the map that coincide with fights for Vegeta or Gohan story modes, but they appear locked and inactive, and I can only view the characters involved. This is basically a waste of space. There's really no point to seeing these on my current character's map, because I can't know what the battles are or even read recaps about them, and I can't interact with them in any way, and they don't change even if I do play their corresponding battle in the other character's story modes. They just stay there, blank and grey and taking up my space. It took me a while to even understand how this map functions when I first started playing. Regardless, it is a minor complaint in the general scheme of things. The story mode is told through a bunch of stills and slow-mo camera movement shots, intermixed with narration and dialogue. There are major cinematics every once in a while, but not often. It's a simple way to cut down the game's budget, and I didn't mind it as it still looked fairly cool, even if the narration is silent. Now, the double-edged sword with the story mode comes with the matter of how much it tells and how much it hides. Sparking Zero's episode battles flow through the story at breakneck speed, glossing over a lot and explaining major things in one or two sentences. In a way, it assumes you know the story. This is good, because for people like me, you don't have to overly linger on things you've seen a dozen times before. But it also makes it really hard for new players to get into the flow of things. Even as a Dragon Ball diehard fan, I got confused sometimes with how fast the story was going. It's a controversial decision, which frankly, I can't tell if it's good or bad in the long run. As far as the branching what-if scenarios, they were mostly hit or miss for me. I won't get into spoilers here because they are worth experiencing on your own, but I'll speak about them in a general sense. 
Some are extremely fun and go through awesome character scenarios. Others have been given much less attention and barely cause enough of a difference to warrant a what-if scenario. But the good ones, the ones that the developers seem to have given a fair share of time towards making, those you can tell have a lot of heart and soul put into them. The characters are represented in a very faithful way, and you can see their core personality traits, strengths, and weaknesses highlighted in a way that even the anime seems to forget at times. More than that, you get a lot of side character involvement, which is awesome to see given that there's so little of it in the anime at this point. You get some reactions and jokes from Yamcha, Krillin, Tien, and Chao Tzu, and it's just nice to see them make an actual appearance. More than that, a lot of these what-if scenarios really utilize the characters in a smart way. We get some cutscenes of the Z fighters playing smart and combining their abilities and supers in very unique ways, and you can tell that the developers really did their research here. It feels like they were really passionate about these characters, and in the places where they had time, it really shows. Casting the what-ifs aside, some characters' episode battles have very significant flaws. Vegeta, most notably, has really been given the middle finger, having his entire super arc removed. His story ends at the Boo Saga, and it's just a very weird decision, which can only be justified by time constraints or a lack of budget. Goku and Gohan's stories extend into Super, and so does Future Trunks. But Vegeta, the second main character in Super, doesn't. Piccolo also gets shafted, and has a story mode end at the Cell Saga, which is absolutely crazy. I know he doesn't do much later on in the series, but he should have still showed up a little. That's my favorite character right there, and they're kinda disrespecting him, and I cannot have that. When you finish Goku's episode battle, you unlock Jiren's episode battle, which was the worst one for me. It's incredibly repetitive, and the what-ifs basically don't matter and lead to nearly identical results. I don't think there's enough here to have warranted its inclusion. Trunks' story mode also misses out on a great opportunity of showcasing his timeline's Boo Saga, which we know briefly about from the manga and would have been cool to experience for the first time. Moreover, in episode battle, you often play as versions of your character with minor variations, like future Trunks from Super but without his sword, for example, or like a Goku who has his ultimate attack changed because at this point in the story it isn't unlocked yet. Weirdly, these variants of the characters aren't usable outside of the episode battle mode. You'd think that, given that super and ultimate attacks have been programmed to allow changing in the story mode, you'd be able to do it outside of it, but apparently not. Some what-if scenarios even let you play as or encounter a character but with major costume variants that are also completely inaccessible anywhere else. If the models are ready and in use, then why block them off? It's a weird choice, and one that never showed up in any of the previous games. All in all, Episode Battle is acceptable, but it suffers from glaring issues. The quality of some of the what-if scenarios and the love the developers have put into some of the characters and stories elevate it and make it good. But there just seems like there's a lot of missed opportunities here. Here's hoping we get extra content in future updates, and that they give us access to all the alternate costumes and characters we've already encountered in Story Mode. Custom Battle Sparking Zero's most unique mode and a new addition to the franchise. With this, you can create your own custom battles, with full-on cutscenes and lines of dialogue and conditional events and whatnot. It should be mentioned though that the dialogue here is hella awkward. I guess this is an issue that came about during the translation from Japanese to English, but basically the way things work with the dialogue in Custom Battle is that you choose from a list of predetermined phrases, where there are some variable words you can slot out for other words from more predetermined lists. What this ends up creating is incredibly clunky, awkward dialogue full of grammatical errors. It's kind of charming in its own way, and after a while you do get used to the weirdness of the dialogue that you learn to ignore it. But still, it prevents you from making an effectively serious custom battle, and can lead to things just not making complete sense in the custom battles that you do play. In this mode, you can also choose to play other people's creations, as in custom battles that they've posted online. People have already gotten incredibly creative with their published custom battles, and by incredibly creative I mean insanely comedic. 
So many of them had me cackling, especially with this new lore that seems to have propagated throughout a lot of these battles where Kaaba is the strongest in the universe and the master of all evil, all based around the infamous base Kaaba versus Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta meme. There are also a ton of weird child extermination missions where characters like Goku just go on some rampage and start beating up all the kid characters. I shouldn't laugh, but something about the absurdity of it all is just genuinely hilarious. You can also find some serious custom battles that aim to mimic some of the Dragon Ball movies and Dragon Ball GT, which are pretty alright too. With time and some further attention from the developers, I can see this mode blossoming further and further, but for now, it's at the very least some stupidly good fun. Even though I didn't personally engage with the battle creation aspect of it all, but that's more because I didn't have the energy for it, and not because of any particular issues there. There are also some pre-made bonus battles, which you unlock by playing through the story. They're mostly pretty nice to play through. There are some interesting stories here and there, and some fun, wholesome scenarios from time to time, so I do recommend them. Again, it's hard to get used to the clunky dialogue, and it isn't really gonna substitute fully voiced what-if scenarios, but it's a nice addition nevertheless. Battle Mode Online I am absolutely mid at online play, and my internet is so terrible I can't even engage with it, so I don't get to say anything here. Battle Mode Offline now, with offline play, there are some things to go over. While this is your typical Budokai Tenkaichi battle mode, where you can have single battles, team battles of up to 5 individuals, or DP battles, there are some minor issues here. First and foremost is the god-awful character select screen. The characters are spread around very weirdly, and the UI itself is very messy and amateurish. Additionally, transformations occupy their own spaces as opposed to being variants on top of base forms like in previous games. It is a major downgrade compared to the way they were made in the previous games. The way you get into battle is nice though, what with the characters showing up in the map that you already chose and diving straight into battle once you're done choosing them. There are also a ton of interesting character interactions that you can get when you choose certain characters as part of your team at the same time, which are nice little addition. As far as the maps slash stages go, even though the map selection is decent, it skips out on a lot of the classics from the series. Kami House, Glacier, Kami's Lookout, and a ton of others are missing from the game. You notice this very clearly when you play story mode, because there are very little variations in your locations. It's good that we're given time variations on a lot of the locations, but still, we're missing out on a lot. Hopefully, they'll add them in in future updates. As far as the maps themselves, they're okay, much bigger than they were in the previous games, and the destruction elements are decent. You can appreciate them the most in city maps, because then there's a lot of shit to break there, and seeing buildings crumble or fighting in their ruins is really awesome. However, it doesn't seem like you can trigger planet destructions like you could in previous games, which is a shame. Seemingly, you can do it on planet Namek, but even that is super unreliable. Additionally, sometimes basic obstacles can get in the way of your super attacks, which is just silly and really breaks immersion for me. A simple building isn't supposed to tank and stop my ultra mega death ball, so come on. With offline play, you can also go for local split screen multiplayer but only in the hyperbolic time chamber, which is a shame. I'm glad they ended up adding local split screen in any capacity, because it is a true staple of the series, but it sucks that you can't take it to the other maps. The developers mentioned that the destruction elements basically get too heavy to render in a split screen situation, so only a barren map like the time chamber would work. Maybe it's wishful thinking, but I'm hoping they manage to fix that in future updates, even if they have to make destruction minimal in those maps. Otherwise, battle mode is exactly what you'd expect, except as I mentioned previously, the music that you can select from isn't all that great. There's also some more I want to touch on about character customization, but I'll save that for another section. World Tournament This one is pretty basic. You can either create a tournament with custom settings of your own, participate in online ones, or choose to play from a few pre-made themed tournaments from the anime. 
I really like the tournament mode here, even though I didn't engage with it much in previous BT games. And it's mostly because I liked hearing the commentary from the themed tournaments, such as from the announcer in the World Tournament, from Cell in the Cell games, or Yamcha in the Yamcha games, even though they even commentate on the fights they themselves are involved in, which doesn't really make any sense. It's also really nice to play in the tournament stage map and see the crowd flee when you pull off a super or ultimate, opening up the entire of the stage for you to play around in. It feels so true to the anime, in a way, and really immersed me in playing. I just love to see it. Super training. Pretty basic, but well executed. You have some free battle training, with a ton of options for what you want the enemy AI to do, and you have some structured tutorial training, which covers a lot of the mechanics decently well. I recommend you go through everything in the training at least once, because there is a lot there. However, there's stuff that it doesn't teach you, and you will have to learn through actual gameplay. Missions and Challenges This is not so much a mode as much as a place to redeem some of your in-game accomplishments. With Xeno's Orders, you get titles, which are just fancy headlines to place on your online gamer card thingy. With Luis's stamp book, you get Dragon Balls, which allow you to summon Shenron. There's nothing special here, and the missions are basic stuff, mostly, that encourage you to just play the game. Stuff like use Goku in battle 50 times, use revenge counter 100 times, and so on. Whis's stuff is a little more niche, with uh, more specific stuff you need to do with specific characters, like finish a battle with the Dragon Fist for Goku Super Saiyan 3. Regardless, there is nothing much here except the neuron activation of cashing in rewards and hearing Z you know, say the same thing over and over again a million times. Dragon Balls, Chop, and Customization And since we're on the subject of Dragon Balls, in Sparking Zero, similar to the previous games, you can gather Dragon Balls to summon a dragon. But here, you can summon Chenron, Puranga, or Super Chenron, depending on which Dragon Balls you collect. Normal Earth Dragon Balls are obtained by completing Whis's tasks. Super Dragon Balls are obtained through finishing specific characters' story modes. And Namekian Dragon Balls are obtained through... I don't know. I, I never got any. I read online that there's supposed to be a random drop in 1v1 battles, but I never really got one myself. Regardless, once you've gathered 7 Dragon Balls of a specific kind, you can call forth the corresponding dragon. When you do, you get to make a wish. The wishes are frankly not very exciting, and on top of that are pretty vague. You can choose to get Zenny, unlock characters, gain XP, get costumes, get titles, get ability items, or get dragon orbs, which are items that help you make a single story mode battle easier to complete. Specifically, if you want to fulfill a secondary condition that allows you to unlock a branching what-if scenario path. These are all the wishes, but some are available to one dragon and not to others, and some are shared by all. Regardless, I found all of them mostly useless. Aside from unlocking characters, everything else felt very meaningless. Sure, the few costumes on offer are cool. But otherwise, I don't really have any use for Zenny, XP, ability items, or titles. This all goes back to an issue with the customization feature itself, which I feel is redundant overall. First off, each character you play as, including transformations, have something called a proficiency, represented through a number of stars. The more you use a character, the more proficiency you gain, the more you fill up stars. To be blunt, proficiency is meaningless. I played the whole game not knowing what it did, and only during research for this video did I realize it's basically just a fancy display gauge for how much you use the character. Higher proficiency just means you use the character more, and other players can see that and know how much you like the character or something. You also get Xeno rewards for attaining certain proficiency levels with characters, which just gives you more titles, which is not really worthwhile for me. Anyways, proficiency has no impact on character customization. Character customization consists of a few things. First is the character costume. Sadly, most characters don't have a second costume. Sure, we have a ton for the main cast, like Goku and Vegeta, but most others don't have anything. Even basic alternate outfits for side characters are missing. 
Second up in customization is ability items, which you can use to enhance your attack, defense, supers, or whatever. Personally, I never found a use for these, as a few hours into the game, I was already storming through every fight that got in my way, and even the max difficulty enemies were barely breaking a sweat for me. And remember, I'm mid at this game. So to me, I didn't want to make it even easier by enhancing my characters with ability items. Maybe they can come in handy in online play, but then that's just going to lead to further balance issues during those battles. Besides costumes and ability items, you can also add accessories. Adding accessories doesn't mean what it seems to mean. It doesn't mean you can buy or unlock accessories like Trunks' sword, a scouter, or a halo and apply it to any character. No, it just means that characters that already have a particular accessory can have it applied to them. So, Goku gets a halo at some point in the story, so you can unlock a halo which you can give to Goku. Bardock has a scouter in the anime, so you can toggle it on and off for him as an accessory. But that's just it. You can't really apply any accessory to any character, but rather specific characters get specific accessories that they might have appeared with in the anime, and you can just toggle them on and off. Even in the older games, you could apply something as simple as a halo to virtually any character you want, and you could even customize auras and whatnot. Here, neither of those are a thing. Accessories are just very disappointing. It's such a criminally underutilized feature. The rest of the customization elements consist of emotes, voice lines to go along with those emotes, and background music. I don't really care about any of those, but maybe online players can find joy in them. I won't touch on them any further because, as I mentioned, I barely played online. All of these customization elements, save for accessories, can be bought in the store. You can buy characters, costumes, ability items, emote voice packs, background music, strategy items, and some player card backgrounds. Personally, I prefer for things to be unlockable rather than straight up purchasable. But regardless, the shop is mostly useless. You get so much zenny by playing the game and you don't really need to use any of it. The first time I ever bought anything at the store was when I had actually finished all the characters' story modes. I didn't know how to unlock all the additional characters, so I just bought them, and I bought all the costumes just out of a sense of completion, and feel like I used up my zenny for something. Besides that, I didn't care for anything else. The whole customization system just feels tacked on as an afterthought, from the small selection of outfits, to the needlessness of the ability items in the face of relatively weak enemy AI, to the meaninglessness of emotes, sound packs, and music for people who don't care about online play. It's also underwhelming, I barely even registered it as part of the game. Subsequently, this is why Dragon Balls and their wishes feel unimportant, and I never really felt the need or desire to gather them in any capacity. Gallery Last but not least is the gallery. Here, you can view your in-game data and statistics, and you can watch battles that you recorded. But, more importantly, you can view the Encyclopedia. The Encyclopedia has always been an awesome feature in the series. Most notable in BT3, you could hear commentary from Chi-Chi about each character. In Sparking Zero, they've taken it up a notch with the Girl Talk feature, allowing Bulma, Chi-Chi, and Fidel to comment on each character and have a small conversation about them. It's super wholesome and has a ton of nice references. This is more of the stuff you can tell was made with a lot of love. One thing this mode lacks, however, that the previous two installments had, is the character introductions, where you could read more about each individual character. I loved reading those as a kid, and uh, they're part of the reason I got so invested in this franchise. Nevertheless, this mode is an absolute win overall. And there you have it. That's basically everything in Sparking Zero. With all that said, do I think Dragon Ball Sparking Zero is a good game? Definitely. Even in isolation. Do I think it's a mind-blowingly amazing game? No, it's pretty good. But there's a lot of missing potential here. Even before I played it, I was at peace with the fact that Sparking Zero was never really going to meet the heaps of expectations placed upon it. People have waited nearly 17 years for a new Budokai Tenkaichi game. They've even made their own. This franchise is such a core part of many of our childhoods and means so much to me and many others. I think however it had come out, it would have failed to meet all the hype and expectations placed upon it. 
Simultaneously, I think as long as it was even just remotely decent, we would have all loved and played it. Because, again, it's a big part of our childhoods. I spent literal years of my life playing these games. I rediscovered them in adulthood through PS2 emulators and realized the magic was still there. This sequel, uh, it's supposed to speak to my inner child. And in a way, it did. It pulled that off. The critic within me can't help but notice and be disappointed by the issues here. But at the same time, I can't help but enjoy it. Nostalgia and connection aside, it's clear that the developers put a lot of passion into this. It doesn't feel like a vacant cash grab, bastardizing the Dragon Ball name to make a quick buck. No, it's committed to providing an experience that at least rivals that of these old classics. And for that alone, it has my respect. So, if you're a Dragon Ball fan and you haven't picked this up yet, I think you should. I think there's still chance that most of the issues I had with it will get fixed over time if this game gets at least half the long-term support that games like Kakarot and Xenoverse did, then you can bet it will be cared for and updated for years to come. So uh, if your inner child wants to play this, then I think you should let them. And hey, who knows, maybe in time, Sparking Zero will become the new classic, making core childhood memories for young Dragon Ball fans everywhere. That'd be one hell of a legacy to leave behind. Another way to remember Akira Toriyama and Dragon Ball, the incredible story that he's created. But anyways, if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I'm happy you spent some of your time listening to me ramble on about a video game and anime I'm so incredibly passionate about. I know I don't usually do video game reviews, but there are a few games here and there that interest me, and rarely there will be more videos like this. Well, uh, there will be another one soon enough, but after that, it'll be rarely. Let me know what you thought of Sparking Zero in the comments below. Tell me about your favorite parts, your least favorite parts, any quarrels you had with it. And uh, leave a like if you enjoyed the video. For now, thanks again, take care, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.